welcome to Simple OT. My name is Sarah and I am an occupational therapist. This video will review various models and theories used in occupational therapy. I just wanted to put a quick disclaimer and say that the methods that you see in this video are just some of the ones that I use to learn and study all these different models and theories and they're not necessarily the best for everyone but hopefully it helps simplify these really broad and intense topics they're really intimidating right so hopefully this helps bring it down to earth and clarify major themes so to start off i just wanted to show you what we will be talking about today we have a handful of just really basic in my opinion basic occupational therapy models and theories and I think of them in three distinct groups and so to start off you can think of the intrinsic models these are models that relate to motivation or internal processing and within these models we have first of all moho moho mohovation remember this model is all about motivation and client-centeredness. It really asks what matters to the individual and goes off from there. And so to memorize this, I think of a to-do list. I think about making my own to-do list and ranking things that I want to do first and I'm most motivated to accomplish. And I check those things off. And so examples of this could be the role checklist, the OSA as well as the volitional questionnaire. Um, just to clarify, the OSA is the occupational self-assessment, both peds and adults. Moving on to occupational adaptation, this model refers to a patient's desire to improve or master a skill as it relates to adaptation. Um, I put this in intrinsic because I think some key takeaways are that there is this internal satisfaction, self-mastery, as well as internal adaptation that can go on in this model. Um, it's also worth noting that this model has a environmental component so it doesn't perfectly fit into this category. I put a little green like attention or a caution sign just to remind you that you can very well add up things within the environment right and then down here i have just mental health models and frames of reference um, these are pretty easy to remember if you just simply look at the prefix is psych and psych is psychology right so looking at that, you can make an educated guess that these three psych models all relate to mental health. Um, the psychosocial rehab model was one that piqued my interest because I honestly didn't really know much about it before reviewing and studying for the test. Um, but this basically is one of the intrinsic uh, models or frames of reference that centers around patients' beliefs and also considers one's values as well. So moving on to behavior-based models and theories, we have the cognitive behavioral model. This model focuses on changing or altering negative or harmful thinking. This immediately reminded me of cognitive behavioral therapy or just like talk therapy talk therapy in general which is why I drew this little like therapy couch here where you would lay down and talk to your therapist moving on to the behavioral model this model really centers around changing behavior through teaching change this reminded me of the trans theoretical model which is this model here and it's the one that talks about pre-contemplation, contemplation, as well as several other stages of change. Not exactly sure why, but my brain just made the connection here. Moving on to the occupational perspective model, 
this model talks about changing behavior through activity or occupation. This is so OT. You can alter events with activity. So the example I thought of was if you had a dementia patient who was upset or irritated, you might give them an occupation or a task to kind of change the situation, but more specifically change their behavior, help them de-escalate, change their behavior with a really repetitive or familiar task, such as laundry to kind of, you know, de-escalate, but also change courses. So moving on to the environmental models and frames of reference, we have right off the bat the ecology of human performance. This one has always been tricky for me, so I really, really boiled it down to its absolute most basic concepts, which is that the environment influences performance. Essentially here you have the interaction between the person, the environment, and the task produces the outcome of the performance. I wanted to put a little caution here because to me that's very similar to the model we will be discussing next. One way you can differentiate it from all the other models is that it actually has this really specific five distinct interventions. They are establish and restore, modify and adapt, alter, prevent, or create. And there are plenty of resources out there if you're interested in learning about the specifics of each of those intervention levels. So moving on to the PEOP model, this one's going to be again similar to the previous model. Um, except it doesn't have those levels we were talking about. And so the PEOP model or the person environment occupation performance model looks at the intrinsic factors or the person with the extrinsic factors or the environment, as well as the occupation and the performance, how they all overlap to produce the occupational performance and participation. All these factors contribute and work together to influence both performance and participation in occupation. And there's just no specific five levels of anything here. So that's how I remember it in comparison to the ecology of human performance. And lastly, our tried and true classic PEO or the person environment occupation model. Um, this model focuses on the fit or the interaction between the person environment and occupation. So this um, here essentially highlights an optimal fit of the person environment and the occupation. This would be optimal performance here at the intersection versus this diagram is a very imbalanced and off-centered um, diagram of the PEO model with very minimal overlap. So here, when you look at it like this, where the environment and the occupation are limited, warning signs should go off in your brain because something like this could actually be an indicator of decreased quality of life due to poor environmental supports or perhaps even occupational deprivation. It can, however, give you a clear visual of things to target for intervention planning. I hope that this brief overview of all these models can help you in some way. I know they're pretty abstract and also very overwhelming, but when studying for the test, I felt it was best to just do broad strokes and understand concepts conceptually rather than in specific detail. I'd recommend the same to anybody else. As always, keep up the good work. Don't give up. You're doing wonderful. It'll all be over soon. Keep on studying.